Dr. Adidayo. It's good to have you on State Affairs. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You just returned from Congo. Yes. Oh, devastated Congo. Yeah, devastated Congo. Did you see Africans with boardings on their head on the roads of Mkavu? Yeah, um, uh, comparatively. Of course, I was in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, and spent two days in Rwanda. Thereafter, I went to Congo. Uh, when I was in uh, Rwanda, you saw an, an African experience. Uh, you, you, we saw a country, you know, which uh, many 25 years ago went through uh, intra-societal violence, where at least about, a, one, about 1 million people were killed, you know, in the crisis between the Hutu and the Tutsi. And you now find a country that had woken up from that debris, you know, picked itself up from the debris. And today is a country that is of envy in the whole of Africa. I kept on shouting, you know, while uh, walking through the city of uh, Kigali. Neat city, wonderful infrastructure. You find uh, multinationals struggling to take a... Uh, take, to have their feet in uh, Kigali. You have a country where people have forgotten the, the violence that they went through. i give you an experience. I went to the um, uh, Kigali Memorial Genocide Memorial Center. And uh, when we got there, of course, we were showing all the, the clips of the crisis. We saw heads, you know, dry heads of people, parts of the body and all that. And... We got to, you know, their bookshop, the bookshop inside the memorial. One of my friends that we went together met the attendant and asked her, are you Hutu or Tutsi? She said, and, you know, with a, with a smile, mm. she said, I won't tell you that. He said, it's even criminal for you to ask me. It doesn't exist anymore. That it doesn't exist anymore. But it was created. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a creation of, was a, of, of colonialism. It was a creation of colonialism. And, you know, which cost the people, you know, in terms of human, uh, human sacrifice. Because at last there is no language like Hutu or Tutsi. They, exactly. They speak, I mean, their, their language from what I could gather was, was, uh, was the same, apart from the French that they also speak. But you see, what struck me really was the capacity or the capability of a people to neutralize there are differences. Although some people say that it is a facade, that it cannot last. Because it is anchored on dictatorship? It's, of course, they said, uh, I mean, Kagame, you know, is dictatorial. But I also tell people who tell me that. Likwan, you was a dictator. Yes, he was. But I also tell people who tell me that, that in a society, in a maniacal society, where people could descend to the level of killing themselves the way Hutu killed the Tutsi, then you need a dictator to be able to have a kind of society that Kagame has in Rwanda now. Even China's economy is built on dictatorship. Dictatorship. So in, a, in, a, in some way, uh, I, I really, because you could see that even the West is not, is looking the other way while uh, Kagame is spending, you know, years in, you know, in, in government. And mm. the dictatorial tendencies are not, they are not seen to be in existence. But I think that the people of Rwanda are happy with the kind of society they have post the genocide. I hope we are not endorsing authoritarianism. I think in a way I'm covertly endorsing the authoritarianism of, um, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Kagame. Kagame. It's unfortunate, really. But if you see the transformation in Rwanda, you know, especially from a society of brutality that I inherited and the kind of, because I can, you know, you could be like the cabman, the man who took me, the, 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 the driver. I, I asked him the same question. He said, and you know, of course the guy couldn't speak English. And the guy said, look, I'm not Hutu, I'm not Tutsi, I'm a Rwandan. There's a value reorientation. Value reorientation. And there's a way you could do it. You know, if in a dictatorship, you could be in the public and say what the dictator wants you to say. But in the recess, you know, in, in, in the recess, 
where the second ear is not listening to you, you couldn't confess what is inside you. But you found the people that I interacted with, even when a third ear was not there, except ours, you know, confessing the Rwandan ideal. And that struck me as, if it is a mind structuring, that mind structuring has worked tremendously. But don't also forget it's a police state. It's a police state, I mean. But the, for such a maniacal society, you need some level of policing that it's, is higher than normal. For instance, if you're going into Rwanda, you are, you are advised to, you are going to the Rwandan airport, the Kigali airport. You are advised to go there, get there two hours before your flight. Because as you are entering, there's going to be a long queue. You know, as you are entering, they are going to subject you to a thorough, I had never seen that level of thorough uh, search in my life. They frisk you, machine frisk you, they send dogs to also search your luggage. Don't also forget that the former president of Rwanda, had his plane, his airplane shot. He died. It, it was shot down right there at the Kigali airport mm. with, uh, is it the is it Burundian president who was with him? Yeah. If you had a society that was that, that was that maniaca, then you needed that level of policing that they have in Rwanda. But Congo has not learned any lesson no, from its see, neighbor, I, okay, Rwanda. Okay, I, I was going to tell you. I left, um, I left Kigali on Saturday en route uh, yeah, a Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, a 27-minute flight from Kigali to from Kigali to a place called uh, Kamembe, which is the border town. And so we came down, and uh, we were driven from Kamembe, uh, I think it's, a, it's an airstrip, to the border, and you now began to see Africa. Mm. You began to see Africa, horrible roads, my God. In fact, when I got to Bukavu, we were to go from Bukavu to um, Kalambo, uh, the place of the event I went for, we discovered that the roads were worse than Nigerian roads. But some, it's uh, a war torn country. War-torn, what do you expect? I mean, you can, you can excuse it. Yeah. But at the same time, the, when was the war? If you, you, you saw, you saw what I saw. Congo has always been in a war situation. What I saw in totality was a country that was not ready to wake up from his African situation. Or did you see a country that has been devastated, devastated. by the rest of the world? I agree with you. In because fact, of its resources. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, somebody told me that. Because I said, they said, oh, the, um, uh, what's the name of the, this place now? Uh, Bukavu is like, is like this because, uh, because of the war. And they said, you couldn't get to even Kinshasa by road. Kinshasa, which is the state capital, uh, which is the capital of DRC, you couldn't get there by road because the road is horrible. And you see, on my way back from uh, Bukavu, now to Kigali, I had to go by road. My God, one of the, I mean, wonderful road. You begin to see an un-Nigerian experience, an African experience. And I think I was not, I mean, I didn't go through the whole of uh, Rwanda, but from the places I got to, I could see that it was a refreshing experience for Africa. That uh, is a country that has learned from its history. Yes, learned from its history. Has Nigeria learned from history? Well, apparently, Nigeria hasn't learned from its history. I, you know, we're talking about one million people were killed. I was, we were told in history that the people were killed in the Nigerian Civil War were also almost a million. We didn't but learn here anything. here we are. We are worse off than we were uh, during the war.